The Tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice, better known simply as Othello, is a tragedy by William Shakespeare, thought to be written in 1603. The story itself is based on the works by 16th century Italian novelist Cynthio, particularly the story known as Un Capitano Moro, meaning a Moorish captain, that was published in 1565. Othello is perhaps one of Shakespeare's most timeless pieces, given the themes of love, relationships, class and racism, focusing particularly on how people of colour are treated and considered by their white counterparts. What with racism still being a major issue, many people are able to relate to the stereotypes that Othello endures within the story, from being considered lesser or savage, to experiencing the same self-doubt that Othello does about the colour of their skin. By this, Othello remains to be a very powerful story that you might say still reflects an ugly side of society and racial bias. The story begins at night, on a street in Venice, and we are thrust into a heated conversation between Rodrigo, a rich nobleman, and Iago, who we learn is a trusted ensign of the esteemed General Othello. We learn that Rodrigo has been paying Iago to help him court the beautiful Desdemona, the daughter of a senator named Brabantio, but to little success, particularly when we learn here that Desdemona has married the General Othello. While Iago is a trusted ensign of Othello, we learn that Iago actually hates Othello, and that he holds a grudge against him because Othello did not promote him to the position of lieutenant, and instead passed this position to a soldier named Michael Cassio, whom Iago believes is unqualified and inexperienced. Together with their disdain towards Othello, they shout to Brabantio, the father of Desdemona, and declare that she has been stolen away by Othello, and that the two of them are now married. Outraged at the idea of his daughter being married to a black man in Othello, which is played up by Iago who describes Othello as a black ram and a Barbary horse, which is a North African breed of horse, Brabantio wakes up his whole house and finds Desdemona is indeed missing. He believes what Iago and Rodrigo tell him to be true, and quickly summons officers to apprehend Othello and bring back his daughter. We understand that through all of this, Iago is not seen by Brabantio, despite sullying Othello's name, and that he tells Rodrigo that it would be dangerous for him to be known as a slanderer of his general's name. Therefore, he leaves, but tells Rodrigo to tell the search party that they can find Othello at the Sagittarius Inn, where he too will be. At the Sagittarius Inn, Iago is seen with Othello, and we see his web of lies begin to form as he tells his general that Desdemona's father had been badmouthing him, and to expect some resistance in regards to his marriage. Othello's lieutenant Cassia also arrives, but with a message from the Duke, which summons Othello due to the urgent matter of the Turkish, who appear to be moving to invade Cyprus. But as soon as this interaction takes place, Brabantio appears, and accuses Othello of bewitching his daughter Desdemona, as he believes that no beauty like her would ever fall in love with a black man. Othello takes this all in his stride, and calmly tells Brabantio that this matter cannot go before the demands of the Duke, who has summoned him on urgent business regarding the Turkish invasion of Cyprus. Not one to be shirked so easily, Brabantio joins Othello on his way back to speak with the Duke, for he believes justice will certainly be served there. But upon seeing Othello, it's clear that the Duke sides with him, and gives him the chance to explain that he wooed Desdemona through his tales of warfare and battle, and that their love is genuine. Desdemona is even summoned to this meeting as well, and she herself declares that she loves Othello and is absolutely loyal to him. Brabantio begrudgingly stands down, and the matter seems to be resolved, with Othello agreeing to go to Cyprus and fend off the Turks, though not without his wife by his side. Preparations are made, and Othello and Desdemona leave for Cyprus. We see another secret conversation take place between Rodrigo and Iago, who proceeds to manipulate Rodrigo into selling all of his assets and lands in a bid to steal Desdemona away from Othello. When Rodrigo leaves, Iago literally tells us his entire plan, and more about his motives. 
It isn't just because Othello didn't promote him, but also because he suspects that Othello has slept with his wife Amelia, despite not having any proof of this. He intends for Rodrigo to sleep with Desdemona to humiliate Othello and thus take his revenge. But he doesn't stop there. He also tells us that he plans to use Lieutenant Cassio, a handsome man who is well-mannered and charming, in part of his scheme, and that he will tell Othello that he believes there is something going on between him and his wife. It all seems like a very elaborate and far-fetched plan, but we also learn that Iago is held in high regard by Othello, and that Othello is the type of man to trust any who seems honest. Meanwhile, in Cyprus the next day, two men stand on the shore with the governor of Cyprus, Montano, and it is understood that the Turkish fleet has been wrecked by a storm and that their invasion has been prematurely put to an end. Lieutenant Cassio arrives soon after, followed by Iago, Rodrigo, Desdemona, and Iago's wife, Emilia. It's understood that Othello did not sail with them, but arrives moments after. But during this time, we see Cassio clasp the hands of Desdemona in an innocent greeting. Iago tells us that it is gestures like these that he will use to help put his plan into motion. When Othello arrives, he announces that a celebration will take place now that the Turkish are no longer a threat to Cyprus. Everyone disperses to revel in celebration, but we are left once again with Iago and Rodrigo, who complains that this plan is hopeless. Iago continues to spin him lies, but also tells Rodrigo that he saw Cassio grasp Desdemona intimately by the hands, and that if he is not careful, it is Cassio who will end up sleeping with her and not him. Willing to do anything to stop this, Rodrigo plots further with Iago, in which Rodrigo is encouraged to start a fight with Cassio and cause him to disgrace himself. Iago explains to us that eliminating Cassio as lieutenant is all part of his master plan to ruin Othello. During the celebrations, Iago gets Cassio drunk, and right on cue, Rodrigo starts a fight with him. Cassio chases him in a fury, and has to be held back by the governor Montano. However, because he is so enraged, Cassio ends up stabbing Montano, severely wounding him. Iago sends Rodrigo to sound the alarm, and it appears that his plan to disgrace Cassio plays out even more perfectly than he could have hoped for. Othello arrives to see the commotion, and demands to know what has happened. Iago, being a little snake, pretends not to know, but then reluctantly points the finger at Cassio. Othello strips Cassio of his rank of lieutenant, and denounces him before storming off. So embarrassed by his own behaviour, Cassio confides in Iago, and mourns his now ruined reputation. Iago feigns sorrow for Cassio, but tells him that he can get back into Othello's good books by appeasing to Desdemona. Cassio believes that this is a good idea, and earnestly thanks Iago. When he's alone, Iago tells us that he will use the interactions between Cassio and Desdemona to make Othello mad with jealousy. Cassio attempts to apologise to Othello for his actions by sending musicians to play beneath his window, but Othello sends his clown to tell the musicians to go away. Iago then appears and tells Cassio that he will take Othello to examine the town's fortifications, and that this will give him some alone time with Desdemona to try and get his position back. Desdemona seems pretty sympathetic towards Cassio, and promises that she will do everything that she can to help him get his job back, and that she will talk about him every day and night if she has to, until Othello reinstates him. But as Cassio is about to leave, Othello and Iago return. Unsure about whether to say hello to Othello or not, Cassio makes a suspicious exit. Othello queries whether he had just seen Cassio with his wife, to which Iago, who begins planting the seeds of doubt, tells Othello that it couldn't have been Cassio, because Cassio wouldn't have walked away looking so guilty. Othello becomes suspicious, and Iago takes this moment when he and Othello are alone to suggest in a roundabout way that Cassio and Desdemona are having an affair. He comes across as coy and innocent, but slowly begins to plant more and more seeds, 
and goes on to tell him to be wary of how much Desdemona asks for Cassio to be reinstated, and that this will tell a lot about whether she is having an affair or not. Othello thanks Iago for his wisdom and his friendship. After this conversation, Desdemona approaches Othello and tells him to come for supper, but Othello tells her, in a classic line that I've heard all my life, that he has a headache and isn't in the mood. Desdemona offers her handkerchief to wrap around his head, but Othello rejects this offer and the handkerchief falls to the floor. She and Othello leave and the handkerchief is forgotten until we see Iago's wife Emilia collect it from the floor. She tells us that Iago had always wanted her to steal it for reasons beyond her. She presents it to Iago, who is thrilled by it, and unbeknownst to Amelia, he plans to use it to plant in Cassio's room as evidence of his affair with Desdemona. Later on, we see Othello has been utterly consumed by the thoughts of Desdemona cheating on him. He demands Iago to find him proof of her affair, to which, almost perfectly, Iago tells him he saw Cassio wiping his beard with Desdemona's handkerchief which also happens to be the first gift that Othello ever gave her. With this in mind, Othello vows vengeance on his wife and Cassio, and beseeches Iago to help him achieve it. Othello later asks Desdemona for the handkerchief, but when she cannot produce it, having genuinely lost it, she tries to switch the topic, albeit, unfortunately, to the reinstating of Cassio. Othello becomes enraged by the mentioning of Cassio, and storms off. Cassio finds the handkerchief in his chambers, and is confused as to how it got there. However, he appears to like the handkerchief so much, that he asks Bianca, a prostitute who is in love with him, to take the handkerchief and get its embroidery copied. A fellow becomes even more consumed by his jealousy, that he falls into a trance and a fit. Cassio comes by to help, but Iago tells him to come back in a moment as he helps Othello out of his state. When Othello does come to his senses, Iago tells him that Cassio will be returning soon, and that he should hide while Iago extracts a confession out of him. Othello stands out of earshot, and Iago, unbeknownst to Othello, proceeds to prompt Cassio about his prostitute Bianca. Cassio laughs when the topic is broached, and when Iago suggests Bianca is looking for marriage, Cassio laughs even more and declares that he would not marry a whore. Othello misconstrues this and believes that they are talking about Desdemona, making the affair absolutely true in his mind. At that moment, Bianca shows up with the handkerchief and attacks Cassio for giving her an item that she thinks probably belonged to another woman. Othello recognises the handkerchief immediately and just like that, Iago's complex plan full of intricacies and lots of luck is completed. Othello is in no doubt that his wife has cheated on him. Bianca storms off, and Cassio is advised by Iago to go after her to stop her from making a scene. Alone again, Othello begins to plot the demise of his wife and his former lieutenant with Iago, where they agree that Othello will kill Desdemona and Iago will kill Cassio. At that moment, Desdemona enters with the nobleman Lodovico, who comes from the Duke of Venice, beckoning Othello to come home and instating Cassio as his replacement in Cyprus. Enraged by this, Othello strikes Desdemona and leaves. That same night, Othello accuses Desdemona of her affair, but she denies this. Her efforts are seconded by Amelia before Othello storms off again. The two women confront Iago as to why Othello is acting this way, but in typical Iago fashion, he pretends not to know, and that Othello is simply stressed about the matters of state. Later that night, Othello tells Desdemona to wait for him in their bed, and dismisses Amelia from his presence. Simultaneously, the poor horny fool Rodrigo returns and threatens to duel Iago if he does not deliver on what he has promised. Iago assures him that everything is going according to plan, but that with a fellow being summoned back to Venice, Desdemona will be returning too. The only way to keep them here is if Othello had his responsibilities as governor reinstated, 
and the only way to achieve that is if something terrible happened to Cassio, his replacement. He tells Rodrigo that if he is able to kill Cassio, then Othello and Desdemona would have to stay, and he will have a clear path to her. In the thick of night, Rodrigo ambushes Cassio, but Cassio is wearing his armour and is able to sustain Rodrigo's strike. Cassio wounds Rodrigo in the struggle, but doesn't anticipate Iago slashing him in the legs from behind, crippling him. Iago flees the scene, and it is Othello who overhears Cassio's cries for help, and assumes that Iago has done as he said in killing Cassio. This fuels him to do the same to Desdemona, as they had agreed. Lodovico and his kinsman Graziano overhear the commotion and attend the scene, only for Iago to show up shortly afterwards and pretend that he has discovered Cassio's assailant, Rodrigo. Iago kills Rodrigo and then proceeds to play the Avenger of Cassio before pretending to show concern by sending Cassio away to be medically treated. Over in Othello's bedroom, Othello wakes his wife and explains that he wants her to pray before he sends her to the afterlife. She begins to plead for her life and assert her innocence in his claims of her affair, but Othello proceeds to smother her. At the moment of her death, Emilia appears with news that Rodrigo has been killed, to which Othello questions if Cassio is dead as well. When Emilia explains he lives, Othello is mortified and believes the wrong man has been killed. Emilia hears the final sounds of Desdemona in the bed and realizes that Desdemona has been killed. However, it turns out that Desdemona still has one last breath left, which she uses to tell Emilia that she had killed herself. Othello explains to Emilia everything that has happened, that he had killed Desdemona for her infidelity, and that it was Iago who had brought it to his attention. Emilia realizes that Iago is behind all of this, and that it is his scheming that has caused the death of Desdemona at the hands of her own Othello. Montano, Graziano and Iago emerge into the room, and Emilia begins to oust Iago out for his crimes. Iago attempts to silence her, but Emilia tells Othello about how he'd made her get the handkerchief in the first place. Realizing he has been played, Othello tries to kill Iago, but he is disarmed. In the commotion, Iago kills Emilia and flees before being chased by Lodovico and Montano. He only gets so far though, because he is caught and brought straight back to answer for his crimes. Cassio is also brought in, but carried in a chair due to the nature of his injuries, which have left him crippled. In one of his final moves, Othello stabs Iago, but does not kill him, for he believes that this would be too happy an end for a schemer like him. Lodovico informs Othello that he is to be tried in Venice, to which Othello begins an account of how he wishes to be remembered. He then stabs himself and dies beside Desdemona. The play ends with Lodovico giving Othello's lands and property to Graziano, as well as charging Cassio, the governor, with the task of seeing to Iago's torture and execution. Considering that Othello is the protagonist of the play, it is interesting that most of the events take place without him even being present. From the scheming of Iago behind his back, to the very first lines in the play, Othello is unfortunately absent, which speaks volumes when you consider how detrimental this is to his life and his fate. While it would be impossible to be everywhere, it's interesting that Shakespeare seems to focus on where Othello isn't. We never actually get to see Othello's heroism that he is praised for, nor do we get to see him achieve anything remotely noteworthy, mostly because this has already been achieved by him. Therefore, there is little to see in Othello's life beyond his relationships and his compelling character, which means the other characters, namely Iago, are essential in driving the plot forward. You'll notice that Othello doesn't even appear in the first few pages of the play, but that this is reserved for Iago and Rodrigo, as the plot is set in motion. Othello isn't even mentioned by name here, except for the use of more, which historically has been used to describe people who aren't white or Christian, usually in a racially charged way. We see evidence of this by the way in which Rodrigo and Iago refer to Othello 
when speaking with Brabantio that they call him Thick Lips, Old Black Ram, and Barbary Horse. While these terms reveal the ethnicity of Othello, they reveal a hell of a lot more about the societal perspective of 16th century Venice in terms of race. Again, Othello's absence speaks volumes in that the antagonist is introduced first and sets the tone of the play as we begin to understand who Iago is long before we really begin to understand who Othello is. While Othello is thought to be an outsider, and the racial slurs of his peers certainly confirm this, he is considered to be a skilled soldier and an entity who is necessary to the state of Venice. He is held in such high regard that the Duke even summons him to tackle the Turks in Cyprus, and even sides with him over Brabantio when accused of using witchcraft to seduce Desdemona. The Venetian government trusts him so much so that he isn't just sent to fight in Cyprus, but also to maintain full martial and political command. By this, it shows us that many of the characters are able to look past the colour of his skin, and in fact are actually quite drawn to him. Desdemona is understood to have fallen for Othello mainly because of the stories he told her of life in battle, and that these same stories would captivate her father, Barbantio. The Duke himself even states that, I think this tale would win my daughter too, implying that Othello's way with words could captivate anyone, and that he as a person is well liked. But Othello often paints himself as an outsider, whether this be because of his own insecurities about fitting in, or maybe deliberately to maintain his own identity as a man of colour. You'll notice he states, Rude I am in my speech, and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace, which tells us that he is not fully adopted to the Venetian way of speaking, and that he either maintains his own native accent, or that he is too much of a warrior to adopt such eloquence. On the other hand, his comment may simply be acknowledgement that he is not as well versed in the language as his peers, and therefore an outsider. But it could also be a symbol of pride, that he is not well versed in their language because he has been too busy defending the nation on the battlefield. Furthermore, perhaps Othello does not feel the need to assimilate himself within the Venetian culture, given that he tells Iago in Act 1 Scene 2 that, I fetch my life, and being from men of royal siege, and my demerits may speak unbonotted, to as proud a fortune as this that I have reached. And what he means by this is that he actually comes from a royal family himself, and implies that he therefore does not need to impress or prove himself to anyone. To me, Othello has always seemed like a warrior first and foremost. You'll notice he does not shy away from his duties and takes them on wholeheartedly, never once showing signs of being put out by the threat of the Turkish invasion or any other battle. Even when the alarm sounds off as a result of Cassio drunkenly stabbing Montano, he leaves his wife's bedchambers, where he was likely in the middle of consummating their marriage, and arrives to defuse the situation. Othello is certainly a man of principles and honour, and it is the small things like this that see him cut from a different cloth from the rest of the characters. Othello has a great many qualities, but one that sticks out the most is also the one that sees to his downfall. It is of course his tendency to trust people. He tells Iago in Act 3, Scene 3 that certain men should be what they seem. But of course, anyone should know that for the most part, people are not what they seem, least of all, someone like Iago, who is able to hide so well in plain sight. You'd think Othello's time on the battlefield would have taught him the deceptiveness of man, but perhaps on the battlefield there is something more brutally honest about the whole engagement. After all, there is no room for lies when carving your sword through your enemy's guts. The whole endeavour is quite simple, sword meets flesh and death ensues. By this, Othello may have been denied on the finer points of deception, the sort of deception shown to him time and time again by Iago. Going by this, life on the battlefield is far simpler to Othello, because he is not only proficient at it, but also does not need to concern himself with more complex feelings like jealousy. Othello actually tells the Duke in Act 1 Scene 3, For since these arms of mine had seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field. What he is saying here is that since he was young, 
the only thing he has ever known is the battlefield. You might say that by taking Othello out of the battlefield, he becomes far more vulnerable, perhaps to a weapon he does not know how to fight against, that being the lies of man. Another quality that sets Othello back is his pride, which in the circumstances is understandable. His wife's alleged affair causes him to start to believe that he is a lesser man, either because of his age, and his wife would rather sleep with someone younger and more apt, or because of the colour of his skin, and his wife would rather sleep with a white man more befitting societal expectations. It would no doubt be a blow to a man who has gone through so much, that he has endured slavery, brought his own freedom, fought his way through the ranks of the army to the very top, and yet to lose his wife to a man not because of his equal valour, but simply because of the colour of his skin. In fact, it would be less of a blow and more like an absolute kick in the grapefruits, and it's easy to see how this would tear Othello down and cause him to react in the way that he does. Had any of it been true, that is. I for one believe that he would have totally been justified in killing pretty much anyone he wanted at that point. But we must remember that everything Iago said was a lie to destroy Othello, and that Othello's loss of pride comes as a result of his inability to trust his wife, and perhaps more importantly, to trust himself. Othello's insecurities do take away from his otherwise likeable character. That he responds with such venom so quickly at the mere innuendos from Iago shows us how close to the surface his self-doubt lingers. Remember, this is a man who has lived a hard life of fighting, of harsh conditions, and yet it is ironic that despite his hardened exterior, his interior is remarkably susceptible. Iago is able to control Othello like a piece of machinery, using his emotions to almost weaponize Othello's violence into killing his own wife. Iago teases out Othello's lack of self-confidence and replaces it with a hatred, a hatred for his wife, and a hatred for Cassio, and it's because of this that I question Othello's final lines in Act 5 Scene 2, where he states, For naught I didn't hate, but all in honour. While he may have seen it as the right thing to do in killing what he thought was a cheating wife, I think he is somewhat disillusioned that he did this without hatred. You might argue that the man who felt hatred for his wife and for Cassio was not Othello at all, but more like a green-eyed monster. Othello no longer feels like himself by the end of the play, for when asked by Lodovico where Othello is, Othello replies, This is Othello. Here I am. Showing us that he was Othello, but now he is something else entirely. Othello's identity at this point is only furthermore blurred as he refers to himself with an oxymoronic term of honourable murderer. You might say that Othello having murdered his wife and seen the awful scheme revealed before his eyes is now descending into madness and that he doesn't even know who he is anymore. But a glimmer of Othello's redeeming character shines through one last time in his final lines where he tells those in attendance to remember him as he was. He reminds them that he done the state some service, and that they know that which he has done for them. He tells them in regards to the events that have unfolded, that must you speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well, of one not easily jealous, being wrought, perplexed in the extreme, of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away, richer than all his tribe. By this, he tells us, that if they have to tell anyone of what has taken place, then tell them not of the jealous man he had become, but of the man so in love that he allowed his base instincts to get the better of him, which led him to kill that which he desired the most. He goes on to remind them once more of his service, by mentioning a Turkish soldier he came across who was beating on a Venetian citizen, and that he took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. This is the point he impels himself, and in doing so, he leaves those in the room not with just the image of his suicide, but also the image of what was once a hero, who defended the Venetians against their Turkish enemies. Iago. Wait, that's, that's not the right picture. There we go. Iago. Iago is quite possibly the most wicked villain across all of Shakespeare's works, simply because of his sheer spitefulness. It is this spitefulness, though, that makes him terribly fascinating, 
as we ponder on his often shifting motives. From the very beginning in Act 1, we understand that Iago is pissed off because he hasn't been made the rank of lieutenant by Othello, and that this honour has instead been passed to Cassio, a man whom Iago believes does not deserve it. Simply based on this, it becomes clear what Iago's problem with Othello is, and his reasons for wanting revenge are pretty sound. But then in Act 1, Scene 3, Iago tells us that, I hate them all. It is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he's done my office. And by this, he means that he suspects Othello has slept with his wife. This comes up again at the end of Act 2, Scene 1, where Iago tells us he too lusts after Desdemona, because he wants to get even with Othello, as he states, wife for wife. So not only are we given his hatred for Othello due to not being picked as lieutenant, but also because he suspects his wife has been unfaithful with him. But if this is the case, why would he want to be his lieutenant so badly? It's through this that Iago's true motives for hating Othello are often misunderstood, and that his true motives are never really revealed, thus making him even more dangerous. Maybe on some level, Iago himself doesn't know why he hates Othello. Can it be out of racism? It's possible that as a white Venetian, Iago may dislike Othello simply because he is black, and that he cannot stand the idea of taking orders from someone who used to be a slave. Note, he is one of three characters that use racial slurs against Othello in the play, though not to his face of course. It may be that he envies Othello, that he has gone through so much and overcome so much, and now stands above him, his general no less. It's possible that Iago's hatred for Othello is born out of resentment that someone who was not born with the same advantages he has, has managed to go on to do so much better than him. In a more controversial theory, it's been suggested that the reason why Iago plots so intensely against Othello is because Iago is actually in love with him. Yeah, so, you know that old idea that the person who teased you the most in school actually secretly liked you? Well, that's the basis here that Iago deep down is actually obsessed with Othello. It actually kind of makes sense. Iago's every thought in the entire play is with Othello in mind. His very reason for doing anything at all is with Othello at the centre of it. He literally cannot take a breath without thinking or saying something about Othello. He needs to be in Othello's presence by being his lieutenant, but he also wants Desdemona out of the picture too. Heck, he wants Rodrigo to bone Desdemona because it will bring him some satisfaction to see Othello alone. Or maybe, alone so that he can swoop in and have him for himself. Think about it, Iago could have plotted against Othello in a number of different ways. We see Iago is not afraid of bloodshed. He tells us that he has killed many men in Act 1, Scene 2. and We see him kill Rodrigo and Amelia in cold blood. So why doesn't Iago just kill Othello? No, instead he plots to destroy his marriage. And yes, this might be because he wants Othello to suffer humiliation, but you might also say that it's because this puts Othello back on the single market, or that while Iago may not get Othello's affections, no one else will either. Iago at the root of all things though, is a conniving snake. He so perfectly moulds Rodrigo into this obedient pup, convinces him that he can have his desires met, and successfully dangles a carrot in front of his face for the entire play. It is the perfect showcase of his manipulative ability, something we see him use on pretty much everyone. He pulls the walls straight over Othello's eyes with his suggestions of Desdemona's betrayal. He's able to drink Cassio under the table and get the lightweight fool to act exactly the way he wants, and he's even able to get his wife in on the game as well, as she steals the handkerchief for him. Iago isn't just a manipulator though, he's actually an evil genius. While you might say the plot of the story works in his favour, and assists him in achieving that which he wants, you can also say that the universe certainly has Iago's back. Everything that he wants to achieve works out, and sometimes it even works out better than he expected, like with Cassio's prostitute Bianca coming in at just the right time to declare the handkerchief belonged to some whore while Othello was observing the conversation. What makes this all even more compelling is the way Iago reveals to us exactly what he intends, almost like he is winking at us, 
and that we are powerless to stop him. You might say that for all his calculated planning, Iago certainly gets what he deserves at the end. While his ultimate fate is unknown, it heavily leans in favour of him being brutally tortured and then executed, something which I believe we can all agree he definitely deserves. We see by the end of the play that his scheming is entirely unravelled, from the sloppy way he murders his wife in front of several witnesses to the panicked way in which he tries to escape. It seems that no matter how careful Iago was with his devious plotting, he is ultimately unable to save himself against the truth. In this, you might say that Iago's fate is a tragedy in itself, that he's able to outsmart every single person at every single opportunity, but that the only thing he cannot outsmart is karma itself, which comes for him with a vengeance. Another interesting idea around Iago is his hatred for women. Many have asked, is Iago a misogynist? And I for one believe that this is very much the case, given that he makes many offensive remarks about women, both in his talks with the audience, and perhaps quite brazenly to the women themselves. He states of women, You are pictures out of doors, bells in your parlours, wildcats in your kitchens, saints in your injuries, devils being offended, players in your housewifery, and housewives in your beds. And to think, he says this not only in front of Desdemona, but also in front of his own wife Emilia. He also states of women, you rise to play and go to bed to work, implying that they are only interested in playing games and are only good for sleeping with. He also believes that women use their good looks to get what they want, and that even ugly women have a way of getting men to sleep with them, implying that this is a woman's only purpose. You see Iago's misogyny actually take root in Othello, who comes to see Iago's view of women in the same way, notably when he refers to both Amelia and Desdemona as whores. Iago's role in the play is undoubtedly a compelling one, whether you side with him or not. Even a powerful general like Othello is systematically unpicked by Iago's evil plot, and despite his age and experience, he is ultimately at Iago's mercy for the entirety of the play. Iago is essentially the ultimate puppet master, in that he pulls the strings of not only his wife and his lapdog Rodrigo, but also Cassio, Montano and Lodovico, all of who are slowly worked into his web of lies. He not only convinces Cassio of their friendship, but actually gets him to virtually agree to everything he says, despite outranking him. He not only gets his wife to retrieve the handkerchief, but he also gets her to do it without saying a word to anyone else, despite how suspicious it all seems. He is also prepared to deflect any questions that she may have. Hell, he even talks Rodrigo out of suicide, also that he can use him later on. For all of his tricks though, perhaps Iago's greatest move is that he leaves Othello feeling entirely responsible for the death of Desdemona. Desdemona Many arguments suggest that Desdemona is the weakest character in the play. She is a stereotypical noblewoman, in that she is fair and beautiful. But some argue she doesn't really show much else. It may be that as a woman, she is reflective of what a woman may have been like in 16th century Venice, that women were not commanders, politicians, or involved in any major decision making. Instead, often or not, they were housewives, or perhaps even trophies for men to possess. Others see Desdemona as a very submissive character, that she trades her ownership from her father Brabantio to another man in Othello, and that she herself is never truly free. She is fiercely obedient to Othello, and complacent in his every whim, from the belief of his bizarre tale about the handkerchief being infused with magic, to the fact that she actually attempts to take the fall for her own murder by declaring to Amelia that she had killed herself. Many see Desdemona not as an independent woman and a strong wife of Othello, but more like a complacent girl whose obedience renders her more like Othello's daughter than his other half in marriage. But to cast Desdemona in such light is to do her a disservice, at least, I think so. Personally, I quite like her. She's brave enough to stand up to her father in the beginning of the play, and to declare her love for Othello, 
something she does with an audience of some of the highest nobles in Venice, including the Duke. The fellow isn't just any man either, he is a black man, a man who many at the time would have shunned and looked down upon. Desdemona though doesn't care what they think, she tells them all that I did love the more to live with him. My downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet to the world. My heart subdued even to the very quality of my lord. I saw Othello's visage in my mind, and to his honours and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. As you can imagine, she is telling them that she loves him so much that she cannot live without him, and that she had thrown away her old life as her father's daughter just to be with him. She declares she gives him her whole life, and would be miserable if they were separated. She comes across as proud that the Moor is her husband, and doesn't show any signs at all that she would have preferred to have married the conventional white man. Simply by this, you might say that Shakespeare shows us that love itself is not restricted by the colour of one's skin, and that monogamy and romantic bonds form not on the basis of physicality, but on a far deeper level. Basically, it's what's on the inside that counts, unless your insides are Iago. Desdemona is also a fiercely moral woman. We see this by how she promises Cassio, who she recognises as a good man, to help get his job back as lieutenant. She tells him, Assure thee, if I do vow a friendship, I'll perform it to the last article. Which basically tells us that if she likes someone and believes they are good, she will go above and beyond for them which she demonstrates in her pestering of Othello to reinstate Cassio. You might say that her valuing of Othello was the zenith of her valuing anyone, for she even tries to claim his murder of her as her own doing. If that isn't going above and beyond for someone, I, I don't know what is. She begins to play with her independence as one of her redeeming qualities, in that she steps away from her father and the expectations of society and declares her love for Othello even marries him. However, the saddest thing about this character is that she spends the latter half of the play trying to convince Othello that she isn't that independent, all in an effort to appease his insecurities that she is fooling about with Cassio. Instead of encouraging Desdemona to be confident, and grant her the freedom to be the woman she wants to be, Othello stifles her with his bitterness, and even strikes her out of frustration. The tragedy here is that Desdemona loves Othello, but ultimately must sacrifice a part of who she is, or who she may become, also that Othello doesn't get too jealous or insecure that she is going to leave him. To be honest, I think that if Othello didn't kill Desdemona, she probably would have grown bitter with Othello's accusations, and may very well have gone and cheated on him anyway. Basically guys, for the love of God, learn from Othello. Don't go accusing your spouse of cheating on you, because let's be real, it's probably in your head. Or is it? One thing we can be sure about is that Desdemona never cheated on Othello. We can tell this not just because of Iago's narratives, but also by her response to Emilia in Act 4 Scene 3, where Emilia asked Desdemona would she ever cheat on her husband for all the world. Interestingly, Emilia actually subverts the expectations of the traditional woman in the contemporary period by saying, the world's a huge thing, it is a great prize for a small vice. She's basically saying that cheating on her husband is nothing if the reward is great enough. In this instance, she means the world, but by this, you might say that Amelia is a dishonourable person, that she would ever even cheat at all. It makes me wonder whether Iago was onto something when he suspected her of sleeping with Othello. It would make sense why Othello reacts so intensely after hearing his own wife is cheating on him, because he himself has already cheated, and in a sense, may kind of want the affair to be true, so as to vindicate him of his own guilt. In any case, Desdemona is shocked by Amelia's answer, and declares that she herself would never cheat. Desdemona's role in the play is actually quite divisive for some readers when it comes to whether we should feel bad for Othello or not. Notice she doesn't slander Othello in her final breaths, when she had the utmost right to, but instead appears to forgive him for what he has done to her. Commend me to my lord, she tells Amelia, 
which is essentially showing us that even in her dying moments, she wishes to give Othello her love, assuming Lord in this sentence means husband. In any case, the fact that she's able to look favourably on Othello kind of allows us to at least give him our sympathies, that he has been played like an absolute saxophone. Cassio Cassio serves as one of the key characters to move the plot forward, as he inadvertently becomes the main pawn of Iago. While we seldom see things from Cassio's perspective, we understand that he is the perfect fit for Iago's plan, in that he is a young and handsome man, with plenty of experience in charming the ladies. He hath a person and a smooth dispose, to be suspected, framed to make women false, Iago tells us. What Iago means by this is that basically, Cassio's charming persona and his lady killer vibe will serve him well in convincing Othello that Desdemona is having an affair. In fact, Cassio makes for a seamless candidate in helping Iago shape this reality because he is exactly the sort of man that married women would become tempted by. Cassio's boyish charms and his flirty persona make him a well-liked character and he's personally one of my favourites in that he's well-mannered and full of honour. Despite being one who philanders, he maintains a great deal of honesty and integrity for one so young. However, it is his charms that actually wound him up in Iago's plan in the first place, and what is one of his greatest strengths in wooing women ultimately becomes the reason for his downfall. We see this in the way he clasps Desdemona's hands, and while he is innocent, his showy gallantness leaves much of what he does open to interpretation. I smile upon her do, I will give thee thine own courtship, Iago speaks as he witnesses Cassio's forwardness, knowing already that he will be able to exploit the young man's gestures and present them as more than they seem. To think, if Cassio had only been shy or ugly, Iago's plan might not have taken off the ground. Cassio certainly comes across as a ladies' man, and yet, he retains a great sense of honour. We see instances of this where Iago tries to get him to talk about Desdemona in a sexual manner, to which Cassio simply replies, an inviting eye, and yet, methinks right modest, explaining to Iago that while she is beautiful, she's also a lady, and this implies that they should stop talking about her in such a way that Iago intends. Despite being a young man, Cassio has some pretty mature reactions to the events in the play, after his drunken behaviour, which sees him cause a massive upset at the celebrations, which also disturbs Othello from getting busy with Desdemona, Cassio does not try to subvert the blame. He accepts full responsibility for what he has done, and expresses shame as he cries, Oh, I have lost my reputation. You might have imagined most young men in his situation would try to pass the buck, many trying to pin the blame on Iago, who had gotten him drunk in the first place or pin the blame on Rodrigo, who had triggered him into a frenzy. Instead, Cassio acquiesces, and spends the remainder of the play trying to win back Othello's good graces. It's easy to see that Cassio greatly respects Othello, most likely because of his rank and his military accomplishments. But interestingly, we also learn that Cassio is a Florentine, and not a Venetian, and in a way, this kind of makes him an outsider, just like Othello. It's possible that Cassio's bond with Othello stems from the fact that neither one of them truly feels at home in their current environment, and while Othello is far more out of place than Cassio is, it is with this notion that Cassio looks up to Othello in the way that he does. The fact that they are both outsiders also makes them natural allies, perhaps the only allies they each have. It's with this that Cassio is so desperate to make amends, because without Othello, he no longer has a special connection with someone who might understand what it is to be a foreigner and an outsider. The fact that Cassio is a Florentine may also explain why he is so trusting, besides his youth, because he does not know any better of Venetians. Othello tells us that he believes a man should be open and transparent at all times, and perhaps Cassio has this same belief, which explains why he so openly trusts Iago and goes along with his advice. Of course, you might also say that Cassio's trusting of Iago is simply because of his naivety and the classic staple of a young man learning the hard way about trust. Cassio experiences being stabbed in the back, quite literally, 
in the most damaging way, because not only is he betrayed by Iago, but he is also left crippled. This ensures that Cassio's military career is over, which is a tragedy, given that Cassio had only just overtaken Othello by becoming the general of Cyprus. It's only by the end of the play that he realises that Iago is responsible for all the wrongdoings, and through this understanding he's able to show Othello, in his final moments, exactly what has taken place. Despite seemingly losing the ability to walk as a result of Iago's attack, Cassio is perhaps the only character who ends up in a better state than he was than when he began. He maintains a position of significant authority as the ruler of Cyprus, Cassio Ludovico, and it is he who is left to decide Iago's fate. While we see Cassio mostly as a young boy who is known for his flirtations and his wooing of women, we certainly see him mature into a man as a result of the betrayals and violence that plays before his eyes. By this, you might say that Iago accelerates Cassio's transition from boy to man, and that it is Iago who is responsible for Cassio becoming the ruler of Cyprus, and perhaps a better ruler than the whole pack of them, given the experiences he has sustained and the wealth of knowledge to be gained from them. When thinking about the themes of Othello, it's actually pretty easy to deduce the main ones. The most prominent theme as you might imagine is jealousy. Jealousy is the central motivation for not only the major conflicts, but also for the driving of the plot forward. Iago's jealousy is what causes him to go against Othello in the first place, jealousy that Cassio has been promoted over him. His observation as Cassio being a good looking man who is good with women might also be a clue that Iago is jealous of Cassio himself, making him more prone to hurt him in the horrible ways he ends up doing. Jealousy of course plagues our gullible hero Othello, and jealousy drives him not only to paranoia, but also to take the drastic actions that he does. Iago also seems to suspect Othello of having slept with his wife, revealing more about Iago's insecurities, and as well as his jealous thoughts, as he says, I know not if it be true, but for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for surety. You'll notice he says he doesn't even know if it's true or not, but that his intense jealousy leads him to believe that it is, and that he needs no proof to validate his suspicion. It is therefore ironic, and perhaps even more wicked of Iago to use jealousy against Othello, for he already knows the pain of jealousy, and is still willing to inflict it on another. Perhaps Shakespeare is trying to show us the power of jealousy, that it can lead one to harm another in the most horrible of ways. Iago already knows the torture of being jealous, and so, he knows exactly how to use it against someone else. It shows us more of his malignant nature by doing this, and shows us how jealousy has consumed him so much so, that he will stop at nothing to torment Othello, in the same way that he is tormented by such insecurities. Othello shows us that just because something might seem the way it is, doesn't mean that it actually is, if that makes sense. The idea of appearance and reality rings out quite true in this play, where we see characters like Othello begin to see things that aren't even there but that his perspective of the events which has been poisoned by Iago caused him to see his wife as an undeniable cheat. Even in Act 3, Scene 3, where Othello asks Iago, Be sure, though prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof. Iago ends up supplying him with a ridiculous anecdote about how he recently shared a bed with Cassio, and that he had heard him muttering in his sleep, Sweet Desdemona, let's be careful and hide our love. He then tells him that Cassio grabbed his hand and said, Oh, my darling, before Cassio kissed him as if he were trying to suck his lips off, and then proceeded to put his leg over his and sighed as he kissed him before saying, Damn fate, forgiving you to the more. Iago literally makes up the worst fake news story I've ever heard, but so blinded by jealousy, Othello actually believes this nonsense to be true. He doesn't question why Cassio was in his bed, why Iago didn't wake him up and tell him, dude, get the hell off me, and doesn't see anything amiss about this whole tale. Iago even tells Othello that while the only way to be sure if Desdemona is cheating is to catch her and Cassio having sex, he can supply circumstantial evidence, which again, Othello is happy to accept. He's literally going to throw away his marriage because of a circumstantial bit of evidence. Evidence, mind you, that turns out to be that stupid handkerchief and more of Iago's verbal diarrhoea. 
None of this would make sense to a rational man, but to Othello, who has been corrupted with jealousy, we see what this toxic emotion can really do to someone, and how it can essentially derail them into madness. Going back to my point about Iago knowing jealousy, and how to use it, contradictorily, Iago doesn't necessarily demonstrate the same erratic behaviour as Othello. You might say that Iago's jealousy is a watered down half measure, compared to the jealousy of Othello, that sees him kill his wife, and plot to have his lieutenant killed as well. Iago never goes this far, despite having the same suspicions of his wife. By this, it can be said that Iago had no idea what sort of power he was messing with in jealousy, and that jealousy affects people in very different ways. It is with Othello's reaction that Iago's plan works so well, for not even he could expect the level of volatility that Othello would come to express. To sum this up, jealousy is a very powerful emotion, one that has the ability to bring even the toughest, most honourable men like Othello down to their knees, and furthermore taint them into something else entirely. It is jealousy that forces Othello to focus so intently on this one idea that his wife is cheating on him, to the point that it becomes a reality in his own mind. It is this very obsession that eradicates his common sense and his wisdom as an experienced man, and eclipses not only his ability to reason, but his relationships with those he once trusted. What's interesting is that Othello actually returns to being the man he was in the beginning of the play, when he realises Desdemona was not cheating on him. The jealousy in him is almost instantly whisked away, and with it, his calm, honourable and wise persona is allowed to shine through again. It's probably why he executes himself in that moment, because now that he's no longer blinded by the evil that is jealousy, his original traits that had been suffocated now compel him to die for what he has done. The last theme I'll talk about in this video is deception, and it goes hand in hand with the theme of jealousy in some ways. It is of course the jealousy that blinds Othello in the first place. Jealousy prevents him from seeing the truth, and with this, Iago is able to deceive him more and more. It comes to the point where Othello begins to refer to Iago as honest, going on to even give him the moniker, Honest Iago, which just goes to show how high the wall is that Iago has managed to pull over his eyes. Not only is Iago able to deceive Othello, he does it whilst cultivating an identity of a man who always tells the truth. In fact, Othello believes that Iago is incapable of telling anything but the truth, as he tells him in Act 3, Scene 3, I know thou art full of love and honesty, and weighest thy words before givest them breath. He actually believes that Iago gives his words careful consideration before saying them out loud, and while this is probably true, Iago does not weigh them so as to provide honest answers, but weighs them to ensure they coincide with his deceitfulness. The deception played on Othello causes him not to believe a word that his wife says, even with Desdemona telling her husband in Act 5 Scene 2, and have you mercy too, I never did offend you in my life, never loved Cassio, but with such general warranty of heaven as I might love, I never gave him token. Which basically translates to, no, I never slept with anyone else, let alone Cassio, and I never gave him your stupid supposedly magic handkerchief either. Of course, Othello doesn't believe her. He's at the point that the only one he believes is Iago, because what Iago is telling him tragically correlates with what he is suspecting. With this, Desdemona's denial of her affair only makes Othello more and more angry, because to him, she is merely adding salt into the wound by trying to deceive him further. He convinces himself that she is this whore that Iago has painted in his mind, and because of this, she is not able to dissuade him in this belief. I'm reminded of a quote by the author Brian Herbert, who I believe once said, There is no man so blind as the one who has made up his mind. Overall, I think Othello is probably just as relevant today as it was 400 odd years ago. The dynamics of what we feel in relationships haven't changed that much, and while some of us recognise jealousy and may not handle it all that well, I don't think we'd go about trying to kill our spouses because of what someone told us. Then again, you haven't met any of my exes. You know, I knew there was a reason why I identified so much with Desdemona. But anyway, Othello is something of a hyperbole of the jealousy we may experience in our everyday relationships. Perhaps we might see our significant other express themselves to another in a way we might not expect, or maybe we might see them hanging out with someone new. Such scenarios might inspire paranoia, jealousy, 
or straight up obsessive delusions. What we can learn from Othello is that while it may be natural to experience jealousy, it is important not to allow it to consume us. It is important to recognise the signs of such envy, be aware of them, and most importantly, not allow them to take root and blind us into seeing a reality that isn't even there. Unless of course you actually are being cheated on, in which case, yes, you may now act like Othello. But before you go and buy a sword, perhaps you might consider giving this video a thumbs up and hitting the subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, if there's any change from that sword, there is a Patreon page available. Just click on the link in the description and feel free to donate to my cause. See you in the next video. Until the next time guys.